Um, so welcome to Forensic Flows uh, and how to make them better. So I'm Jessica. Uh, I'm a security engineer that focuses on digital forensics and incident response. I've uh, been on a detection and response team for almost seven years now. Kind of wild. Uh, <laughs> it feels like I just started. Uh, I'm a nerd who loves coming to conferences like this. And lastly, I'm a corgi and a cat mom. So here's the obligatory pictures. Um, because how can you pass up a corgi in a backpack? I mean, you know, everyone has to see that. So. <laughs> Um, cool, so what problem are we trying to solve with this talk, right? Overall, forensics tends to be a pretty niche subject requiring subject matter expertise. Uh, detection and response teams then tend to have two extremes, right? Either you have a very small team where you can't have anyone really specialize in forensics because you have to do such a large breadth of areas, or your team is too big to train everyone in forensics and then you only have one or two people who can do it effectively. Um, so, uh, tends to be a little bit of a problem. Um, add on top of the fact that there's so many different types of tooling for forensics, creating an additional burden of having to train everyone for every one of these different tools. And all of this really accumulates into having inconsistent investigations depending on where each investigator is on their forensics learning journey. Um, and inconsistent investigations then cause inconsistent results, meaning you can't guarantee you'll raise or root cause an incident even if you had an alert for it. So with this talk, uh, we want all investigators to be empowered to answer any question that arises from an alert within our, within our pipeline with ease, right? We want to simplify forensics so it can be incorporated into everyday investigations. Uh, so what do we need to do to accomplish this? That's a pretty lofty mission statement. Um, first and foremost, we want to be able to grab artifacts um, quickly and with minimal amounts of tooling for the investigator. We shouldn't have to overthink where an artifact may live, but instead have the capability to just pull it. Then we need to be able to process that artifact into something that any investigator can look at and make a determination on what it means. Um, for example, we can say we want to pull browser history from either a Windows, Linux, or Mac OS machine. Um, and we don't really want to have to think about where does that file reside in that operating system. Um, and then after it's pulled, we don't want to have to think about how do you crack it open? You know, what file format is this browser history in? How do they um, format the timestamps within the browser history? How do they correlate all of the different information together within it? Um, we want to just be able to pull the file and start our investigation, right? Um, and make it really easy. So, and then when building a system that can handle those first two needs, we have to ensure it's scalable. This works best when it doesn't rely on the investigator um, to pull files onto their laptop themselves, but instead can run in an environment that scales on its own and can handle any amount of tasks put before it. We don't want something like the investigator losing internet access um, or a laptop battery dying or really any other trivial, trivial matters to disrupt the collection of evidence particularly when some of that evidence can take hours to complete. Um, and for more consistent investigations and to give people the opportunity to learn what forensic collection looks like, we should keep all of this within source-controlled workflows. We want to ensure things are done the same way every time, and when we want to change a piece of the workflow, we want someone to review the work we've done. Lastly, no matter how cool a system you build is, if you cannot easily integrate it into your existing pipelines, it's never going to be used. Uh, when you design the system, whether it be integrating in new forensic collection or processing methods or integrations into your existing investigation tooling and alerting systems, keeping integrations easy to add on as possible um, will make everyone's lives easier. Um, you really need a flexible system that can grow and change within your organization. Cool, so let's start looking into all of these different needs. Um, the first being that you need to be able to grab artifacts on the fly wherever they're available. However, before you can just go grabbing artifacts, you need to define what these artifacts are. Take some time to understand the pain points in an investigation that you, you commonly run um, and what would have made that investigation easier. Uh, is it a common question like, did this user visit this malicious web page, or was it actually more of an advertising type ad load um, where it was unintentional by the user? Um, is there a collection of logs that you would love to have pre-pulled for every investigation and ready at your investigator's fingertips? 
Um, or do you want to collect a disk image from a cloud instance? Uh, your design is going to be heavily dependent on what will enrich your investigations the most. So take the time to think about what you need. Um, so now that you know some of the artifacts that you might want to pull, how do you do it? Um, well, one of my first recommendations is to deploy some kind of live forensics platform. Um, there's a few options, and you should take into consideration what works best for you. Uh, with scale, stability, the language it's written in, um, the different operating systems it supports, and the amount of engineering effort it's going to take to maintain that system. Uh, one of my personal favorite tools is GUR Rapid Response. Uh, it's a well-maintained open source project from Google that deploys well for 100 hosts or 100,000 hosts. Um, it's written in Python, which is a pretty common language for security engineers and many security open source projects. Um, it has an API client, which allows you to easily hook it into your forensic system um, and build custom workflows on top of it. It also supports all three of the major operating systems, making it really easy for a corporate environment. Um, and it actually has documentation for deploying um, GER clients in Kubernetes environments, which I think is really cool with infrastructure moving towards Kubernetes. Um, there are downsides, <laughs> don't get me wrong. One of the biggest ones is that there's a pretty large learning curve to deploying GER, um, and it does require a lot of tweaking to work well in your environment. Um, so here's a quick overview of what the GER UI looks like. Um, it might look different since the last time you looked at it, if you've tried it before, uh, as they've recently updated the UI in the last few years. Um, here in particular is a host page. Um, if you want to look at a specific machine, uh, you can see kind of all the metadata about it, because that's being collected automatically, um, and information about the users and all the host information. Um, you also notice the green banner that says access granted, um, kind of at the top. Um, I love that GUR comes with an approval workflow because GUR is a highly privileged agent on a host that can run arbitrary code, basically, or collect a lot of different artifacts. And this system is great because it does require, you can set it up to require authorization um, to run any kind of interesting flows on a host. It also comes with a lot of predefined forensic artifacts built into the system, which again, we want to simplify forensics, so let's go ahead and use any resources we have available. Um, they're pulled from the open source forensic wiki, and it does make things a lot easier to use. Um, GUR also supports variables in the path to make it simpler. So you can see one of the variables is like user's home dir. Um, there's a lot of things that uh, you don't have to think that hard about or know about a specific system to run it. Um, you can also grab files from absolute paths, which will come in handy during your investigations when you know a particular file is involved. Um, you can use the API client to start this workflow and then have that file ready for whatever processing you want to do before an investigator even looks at the ticket. There's also ways to browse the file system, which can be useful during an investigation, particularly when you start going above the triage level. Um, so I just want to point it out because I think it's a really cool way uh, to, to browse through. Um, but overall, GUR has a lot of really great features that can help enrich investigations. Uh, but another option, and I'm sure uh, there's always a debate, Velociraptor or GUR, if, if you're in digital forensics, right? Um, so the other option is Velociraptor. Uh, it's a project maintained by Rapid7, written in Golang, uh, and originally created by an ex-Googler uh, who helped build GUR. Uh, so you'll see a lot of the same concepts between the two platforms. Um, it does use gRPC for its API calls, uh, which allows any language to really easily communicate um, to trigger workflows. Uh, it's a bit more stable overall with it being written in Golang versus Python, um, and the clients are really easy to cross-compile into different operating systems. Uh, I would say the greatest strength of Lassa Raptor being easy to deploy is also one of its greatest weaknesses, however. Um, it's definitely simpler to roll out than GUR, 100%. However, the infrastructure does not scale past 10,000 clients, so depending on what your environment looks like, Velociraptor may be a great idea, or it might not be if you have too many clients. Um, yeah, so, you know, and I hear a lot, uh, why would you pick Velociraptor over GUR or GUR over Velociraptor? Um, really, I think it just depends on your use case. I think both are very valid tools. I like GUR a lot because I see how well it scales to an excessive amount of clients. Um, if you're trying to get, you know, 100,000 hosts under it, GUR is great. Um, if you've only got a couple hundred, I might pick Velociraptor because the stability of the Golang is really nice for a server. Um, but it's just going to depend on what your particular situation is. Um, lastly, I just want to mention, like, okay, well, maybe you don't have the engineering resources to actually um, deploy a new open source system, or your uh, IT won't let you do yet another client on the environment, right? Um, 
If you don't have that kind of budget or engineering power to maintain something, a lot of your endpoint detection and response vendors actually have some kind of collection aspect to their product, and they likely have an API that you can interact with, right? Um, so if you already have an EDR installed across your fleet, use it. Use whatever you have already installed. It. It's much easier that way. Um, do whatever you can for the lowest barrier to entry in creating your forensic flow system. Um, another tool I wanted to call out is LibCloud Forensics, um, which is a Python library, um, also maintained by Google, uh, that wraps the big three cloud providers on their native API calls to do things such as disk imaging, starting virtual machines for analysis, uh, querying logs within the projects, or even looking at details for a storage bucket. Um, depending on how your cloud environment is set up, it's great to have these disk imaging capabilities codified um, so you don't have to think about what permissions you need, what API calls you need to make. Um, it gets really strange really quickly, and so having this codified away or using a library to do it makes life a lot simpler. Um, there's also a lot of really strange permissions that you tend to need when you create snapshots, particularly when you're going in cross-cloud cross environments. Maybe you're doing a snapshot in AWS, but you're going to do your analysis in GCP. The permission sets are really difficult, so codifying it in and using a tool that kind of does a lot of the work for you is always the simplest way to handle it. But at the end of the day, the best tools you can use for artifact collection is what you already have installed um, or what you're already used to, right? So build the system. Um, based on where your data's at and how you can get access to it. You don't have to do one of these that I installed. There's a million open source projects you can use and utilize into it and get creative. I think that's the fun part. Um, all right, so we have the collect evidence step done, right? So we've already figured out how do we access our data. But once you have all the evidence, what's next, right? Data is cool, but information is power. You need to be able to transform that data and artifacts you've collected in the last step into a way that's actually meaningful to your investigation with the least amount of training to set investigators, because again, one of our big problems is if you have 10,000 tools that you're deploying, you're not going to train everybody on it. No one's going to be able to use them all. So how do you keep kind of going through and, and uh, making things meaningful for your investigators? Um, I love Turbinia for this. I think it, it comes in really handy. It's designed to do distributed workflows, uh, distributed forensic workloads in a cloud environment. Um, this allows you to run the processing in the background without having to worry about external factors on your laptop. Um, and it also abstracts away having to know how to run so many more tools um, as they're kind of pre-built into the system, like Plaza or Docker and Container Explorer or Bulk Extractor or any of the other ones I listed. Um, and, and to just kind of drive the point home, one issue that becomes a problem really quickly is processing disk images, for instance, at scale. Um, if you have a terabyte disk image, good luck running all the tools on it on your laptop. You probably don't even have the storage space to put it on your laptop in the first place. Um, plus, it would only take a single IT software update uh, from being pushed to have to restart it. And I don't know if any of you guys have worked with, with any disk images, but I don't want to restart that again. It takes forever. Um, so Turbinia really shines here um, in this aspect because it'll parallelize a lot of the workloads and do the heavy lifting for you. Um, it's also, like I mentioned, um, produced by the Google team, written in Python, which makes it really extensible, um, and has an easy API to use to automate these workflows. Uh, one note, though, is it is under active development, so it has had some API changes in the recent past, so just kind of keep that in mind if you want to deploy it within your environment. Um, just know that some things will change when you have open source projects. Cool. I do want to call out specifically Plaza. Um, from the last slide, I, I mentioned it in one of the tools that Turbinia will run. Because um, you could run it separately as well. Uh, Plaza is meant to take in log data and parse it into a usable format, normalize it, and um, make it really easy to work with, right? Uh, calling back to how we want to simplify forensics, this tool really takes out a lot of the heavy lifting by kind of auto magically knowing how to handle a multitude of log types. Um, it's also very extensible because it's also written in Python. Um, so you can do whatever additional parsers that you want so that you can customize to the logs that are specific to your environment. Um, it's also part of the ecosystem with Turbinia and then the following tool I'm going to mention, TimeSketch. So while processing evidence is incredibly important, it's still just kind of one factor. You still need to be able to display that evidence in a usable, easy um, to kind of use format, right? Uh, so this is where TimeSketch comes in super handy. Uh, it's an open source project, um, again, from the Google team. I, I love their projects. I think they have a lot of really great open source stuff. Um, it's written in Python, and it's meant to be a collaborative timeline analysis tool. 
Uh, it really makes a difference when you're trying to understand um, a timeline from like a bigger picture point of view, because you're able to stack up multiple different data sources on top of each other um, and see how they interact. Uh, so love it. Uh, you can import data, you know, JSON data, CSV, or files generated from Plaza, the tool before. Um, it also allows you to search over these multiple data sources, comment, share, and run additional analyzers on them. Um, so to call out the analyzers, it does come with quite a few by default. Um, to help enrich that data for you, uh, such as highlighting search terms for browser history, linking events from predefined common fields, um, tagging logs that meet certain criteria, or even running sigma rules on top of it. Um, they're also extensible, so if you want to do something that's not predefined, it's relatively easy um, to, to add in whatever you can imagine. So I'll show you the, the TimeSketch UI as well, because um, TimeSketch is one of the few tools that I think in your arsenal that you should train all your investigators to use. I think it's incredibly helpful. Um, so I'll show you a little bit. Here you can see um, some timelines that I have kind of imported in. Um, you can use the search bar, put in whatever you're looking for. It uses open search on the back end, so some kind of fuzzy searching, which is really nice. Um, to help do, do that searching on your behalf. Um, something I love, maybe it's silly, but I love that you can customize the different timeline colors because it comes in really handy when you're looking at the timeline itself. It's really easy to say like, oh, well, the pink one looks against the blue one like this, against the green one, and you can differentiate those different data sources really quickly and easily, and they really stand out. Um, this also gives you a really good summary of the events. So you'll see like the message column gives you a quick understanding of what's happening on the machine. You have the data types that'll tell you kind of a little bit more about uh, where that came from. Um, but if you want to know more information about a single event, you can click into it. And any of the fields that were contained in your data as you imported in are now kind of readily available. Um, so time schedule also allows you to label the data, which I think is really cool. So you'll see I labeled this one bad. So now it's very clear to any other investigators that are looking at this time sketch that I think this is bad. I can comment on it and say, this is an interesting event or whatever, right? Um, so it really helps with that collaborative timeline analysis portion. Um, you can also filter in particular fields or filter out particular fields. So you'll see with the gray highlighted line, the plus and the minus filter, kind of cool to make it easy. You don't have to try that hard. Um, you can also do context searching, which I think is really nice. So with the dot, dot, dot um, up there, I think at the top, um, you can do a context search, which shows you all of the events unfiltered um, around your original event, which is really cool. So you can see the red event is the original, and this one's not as interesting, but you can see that there was another event right before it. So it kind of really helps you get a better understanding around critical events. Um, one of the other features I want to mention um, is the uh, analyzers. So there are really a ton of analyzers. You can, these are all um, already included. Right, uh, so there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, you select your timelines, hit the play button, and then your data is enriched, and then you can extend that out however you want. So time sketch ended up being really helpful for for timeline analysis. Cool. So another way you can process your data um, is to run a collected file. So we were talking about pulling files before with a live forensics platform. Now, what if you want to process it by running it in a sandbox? Right? So that way, when your investigator gets to a ticket, they just click a link to the sandbox report. Much easier. Um, one of the most popular open source uh, sandboxes is Cuckoo. Uh, it can detonate a lot of file types, which makes it useful in a lot of different situations. Um, you can also add in additional automation on top of this based on the result of the sandbox. So perhaps you're setting a particular score threshold that would say, we really need to manually investigate this. or you're setting a different type of threshold that would say, oh, if it's, you know, score zero or one, automa automatically close the ticket because it's not a malicious file. So you can create some really interesting automation uh, by adding sandboxes in. Um, another sandbox I wanted to point out was Kate v2, which was derived from Cuckoo. Um, it's written in Python, uh, which makes it a little bit more accessible to modify it, I think. Um, however, one sad part about Kate v2 is it's a primarily Windows file system. Um, so if you run Mac OS or Linux, might not be the right, right fit, but great with Windows files. Um, another great tool is Assembly Line 4. Uh, this framework is meant to triage and help with malware analysis. It's open sourced and maintained by the Cyber Center of Canada. It's also written in Python. You can clearly tell what my favorite language is. Um, and it also supports a lot of different file types. Cool. But the most important tools that you can integrate with are the ones that help your team the most. So understand your investigations and where your pain points are, right? And find tools that solve that. 
Um, and really, use your imagination. Uh, decide what works best for you. You can integrate anything you'd want into this system. Uh, cool. I just dumped you a lot of different tools onto your plate. How do they actually look like from a forensic flow standpoint? Like, how do you start tying all these pieces together? This is how I found works the best, right? You, I find it simpler if you stick with like a single type of collect evidence flow. So maybe that's a collected disk image or it's collect a file, but like a single type. Um, where perhaps you want to run multiple process evidence flows on top of it. Um, so for instance, maybe you collect a file and you want the process evidence step, the first one to be hash that file and collect all of the open source intelligence for that hash. Um, and then separately, you also want to run that file in a sandbox. So that could be how you do, you chain up multiple process evidences. Um, when you try to collect a bunch of different collect evidence types, it gets really messy really quickly because you'll get into a situation where you're like, oh, for this one, do that, but in this case, do that, but maybe do this, and you have a bunch of exceptions and your code becomes spaghetti and nobody can read it and nobody will contribute. So keep things as simple as you can, and, and this is what I found works best. So. Cool, so we covered the first two needs, now on to the third. Um, so we can collect our evidence, we have all the tools for it, we can process that evidence and view it in the most effective way, but how do you start actually building a system to tie all these different pieces together? Um, for me, the most important factor when designing the system is that it needs to be able to run independently of the investigator. I don't think it should be a bash script that somebody runs on their host, like let's build a system um, kind of outside of the investigator. Because if you want to have consistent flows, the best way to do this is to take out the human element. Um, don't rely on people on their laptops. Um, you also want flows to complete as fast as possible. Um, and when you have to depend on individual hardware, you can't really scale those workflows. Um, running in an environment that allows you to horizontally scale um, will make everyone's life better. Uh, some of the flows also require a high level of permissions to run. Um, such as being able to take disk images throughout any project within your cloud environment. Do you really want to give an investigator that permission all the time? Or do you want to give it to a dedicated resource that's easily audited? Um, and then lastly, the quicker you start your collection, the more likely you are to capture the evidence that you need. When you collect a disk image, for instance, if it's part of an auto-scaling group, there's a high chance that by the time a person goes to manually collect it, the disk is gone. Um, and that's always a problem with ephemeral environments in cloud, right? Um, or perhaps you're collecting an, uh, an artifact from an employee's laptop. Maybe the employee or the malware deletes the file before you got a hold of it, right? Um, so the quicker you can kick off these flows between an alert and an investigation, the better. So cool. How do we build a scalable system? I, for one, I love microservices. Um, I think this really solves the scaling horizontally problem. Kubernetes is currently a hugely favored infrastructure um, right now and allows you to build and maintain the exact services that you need. Uh, you can also easily codify the deployment between tools like Terraform and Helm um, so that it's a lot easier to, to maintain, really. We'll go into that more later. Um, by codifying these resources, you really get to take advantage of the stability and the peer-reviewed changes. Um, it also ensures things are deployed in the exact same way you want them to be every single time. Um, so as we go through this section, I'll start building up an infrastructure diagram for us. Um, a little bare right now, because all we know is we want a Kubernetes workflow. But let's go to the next slide and build this up a bit more. So cool. So we know we're going to run in Kubernetes, but we need to schedule tasks, right? Um, tasks need to be schedulable, because there's times when you're going to need an exponential back off, um, such as when collecting uh, from a host you perhaps the host is offline, right? And instead of trying to ping the client a million times a minute because you're going through PubSub or something and it's just like constantly pushing that data, maybe you want to schedule that and delay it maybe one minute, two minutes, five minutes as you're waiting for that host to come back online. Um, so personally, I like a task queue a little bit more. Um, you also want a task management system that's going to scale with you. Um, I like cloud services for this as it's less infrastructure for me to manage and at the end of the day, they typically just work out of the box, right? Um, so I prefer something like GCP Cloud Tasks or AWS Event Bridge. Um, but of course, you could go something self-hosted like Celery or whatever test scheduling system you'd like. Um, cool, so our infrastructure diagram gets a little bit more interesting now. Um, we know we want the task management system to be able to feed in the Kubernetes workload. Um, so we have a task scheduler, 
But how do we actually handle these tasks in parallel? Um, first, we need something that can handle incoming tasks. Um, task queues are typically going to either be a push or a pull model. Um, and for me, I think adapting to a push model uh, is a little bit better, where the task queue typically will hit an HTTP endpoint, and the simplest, uh, and I think it's the simplest way to handle this, right? Um, you're also already going to need to be able to handle incoming requests to, to start creating tasks um, from your automation or from your users, as well as a way to provide information about the workflow. So you're going to need an API server at, at the end of the day. Um, and since we're already running in a Kubernetes environment, uh, we can take advantage of some of the concepts as Kubernetes jobs, um, which are a single run pod that completes and then cleans itself up. Um, and we can use that for the workers. So it becomes really easy to scale out as you can have as many jobs, Kubernetes jobs, as you have tasks. Um, this also separates out the, the worker component from the API server, so you don't have to leave like the API server with a hanging connection um, as you work, th work through to complete a task, which can take some time. Um, then you can independently scale the API server from the tasks, so a spike in one does not bring down the other, uh, which I love. So uh, then add on top of that, Kubernetes actually has a lot of API clients available for many common languages. Um, so you can actually have the API server create and schedule those, those Kubernetes jobs for you. Um, so it becomes even simpler uh, and easy to work with. Um, so now our diagram is a bit more interesting and has a bit more meat. So you'll have the task management system feeding directly into the API server. Um, the API server can then spin up any individual worker that it needs to um, to handle that specific task. And the workers would be the ones that are actually um, connecting to the collect evidence sources or the process evidence sources. Cool. But now we need to think about state, right? Um, for instance, I mentioned earlier, perhaps we're collecting a file from a host and waiting for that host to come back online. We need to be able to understand the state that a task is in as we progress through different workflows. Whether we've completed the task or we're still waiting for the host to check back in before continuing on to the next step. We also want to be able to audit what workflows have been done. So this all leads to needing some kind of database for workflows that can be updated as we go through the process. Uh, one lesson I've learned is the more modular, modules, modules you have for collect evidence sources or process evidence sources, the less likely you are to keep a static schema. So I personally like NoSQL databases for this because um, it makes that a lot easier to handle and allows you to modify your schema on the fly. Um, and a lot of the cloud providers have one you can work with. So again, anything you can offload onto something else, let's do it. The less effort you have to put into this, the better for everyone. Um, so I tend to like to work with um, either GCP Firestore or DynamoDB, but use anything that works best for you and allows you to have high availability of that data and allows you to, to read and write to it. Um, yeah, and you can also deploy your own NoSQL server if you'd like, or, or again, use anything you'd want. Cool. So now we have an API server that can um, create, read, or cancel workflows by interacting with the state database. Um, we can spin up the different workers to handle the task and provide them with minimal information to start it up, um, and they can grab that full context from that state database to understand what workflow they need to run on and where it's currently at. Um, and they'll have the most up-to-date information and be able to update it when it's done. Um, yeah, and so this actually finishes up the basic architecture that you would need for a forensic flow system, giving us an easy-to-deploy, scalable environment to enrich our team's daily investigations. Cool. Uh, awesome. So the next requirement that I had for um, was source-controlled workflows. There's a few different areas to cover here. The first is infrastructure as code. The biggest advantage of requiring infrastructure to be codified is that you know the environment will always be consistent. If there's ever drift, it's really easy to set it back to rights. Um, you can also set up a continuous deployment process for the infrastructure so you don't even have to try hard to deploy. It's just kind of put up there for you, and a lot of businesses will have something like that already integrated into them. Um, there's a ton of different frameworks that you can use to codify your infrastructure, uh, such as Terraform or CloudFormation, each with their own pros and cons. Um, but at the end of the day, go ahead and standardize on whatever your business does or whatever you're most familiar with, but definitely codify that infrastructure. Going further down the rabbit hole, you can even codify your Kubernetes deployment. 
Um, and this can be a lifesaver, because I don't know about you, but I always forget the weird little nuanced deployments that I make um, right after I do them if I don't write it down. So um, yeah, so codifying your Kubernetes deployments are going to have a lot of the same benefits as the last slide, um, with PRs allowing you to have sanity checks um, before deploying, easy deployments by having it all in one place, um, and integrations into your continuous integration and, and continuous deployment environments. Um, also, many different frameworks to do this, uh, so I've just listed a few, but um, I like Helm. I think it's pretty easy to work with, allows you to templatize and make your development environment, staging environment, and production environment really easy to, to plug into um, with just a few different variables. But again, use what's standard in your business um, or whatever you're familiar with, but definitely codify it. And then the last area I wanted to talk about for source controlled workflows is um, workflows as code. Um, yeah, it, you have a lot of the same benefits as before, and while it goes without saying, of course, you're going to be coding up your forensic system, you also get the great benefit of uh, learning opportunities for other teammates to see what we think is important and how we manipulate that data to make it easier for them, right? And so then the code itself can act as documentation within your environment, giving you a single source of truth on how to accomplish different tasks. Um, this can allow an investigator who has to go above the triage level forensics um, to gain inspiration from what has been done in the past um, to innovate to solve their problem. But overall, my main point is codify everything you can. Your future self will thank you. Lastly, uh, the final need is easy integrations. Um, I'm going to break it into three main categories here. So, First and foremost, you want to make it as easy as possible to integrate any new tool into your forensic flows. Um, and the first step is to ensure that all the different tasks are modularized enough that one failing doesn't affect the others. Each task should be in its own little box. Um, next, try to normalize fields between tasks. Uh, for instance, output should always be called output, and error should only be called error. That way, you can always count on these fields being present um, when trying to inform the investigator of what happened um, and make it easier for people to contribute to the project by defining the fields they must always have. Um, if there's also fields that need to be passed from one task to another, think, you know, uh, from a machine into a sandbox, um, or like pulling files from a machine into a sandbox, any module that pulls a file should put it in the same field name so that the sandbox module only needs to know about one specific field instead of trying to translate between all the different preceding tasks. Uh, lastly, if you know there's a common function that's going to be used regardless of the tool being called, place it in a base class so that it can be inherited by your tasks. The more you can abstract away the minutia and let the developer pure, uh, purely focus on the tool they're working to integrate with, um, the more likely others will contribute to your project, um, and the nicer your code base will be. So, the second component um, of easy integrations is integrating into your ticket automation. The closer you can trigger forensic flows to an actual alert, the more likely you are to pull the data integral to your investigation. Um, some data can be incredibly ephemeral, so grab it quick before it's gone. Um, however, to make this simpler on yourself, you need to ensure the alert data that would be fed into your system is normalized. Um, otherwise, unnormalized data, unnormalized data will need a translation layer between the alert and the API call to the, your system, um, making it that much harder to trigger workflows and increasing the barrier to entry on getting your data into the hands of investigators. Um, another thing you want to keep in mind with automation is understanding the throughput you can expect or where you might want to start to throttle. So, for instance, if you have a sandbox with a quota limit, you'll likely want to throttle somewhere um, in case one of your alerts go haywire um, before someone realizes it. I don't know how many of you guys have worked in a SOC, but I have woken up to 10,000 alerts that were one thing that went just slightly wrong, and I would never want that to wear out my system so or exhaust a quota limit. Um, lastly, uh, the final integration piece is you want easy integration into your manual investigations. The best way to get everyone to use forensics in their day-to-day -day investigations is to make it easy for them. Uh, if you have a single pane of glass system for investigations, make a few button clicks or blocks of code someone can use and put variables in for. That way, it's much easier to call your forensic system. Um, then you only have to train an investigator on your single pane of glass system instead of the 10,000 tools under the hood that I've shown you before in here um, in your forensic environment, and people will be more likely to use it. Cool. 
So that was a lot of theoretical, and you're like, all right, Jessica, how is this useful at all? You just talked a lot. Um, let's go into some use cases, right? Uh, so something really common on SOC teams or detection response teams is going to be phishing, right? So let's say you have an employee reach out, and they, they got a fish, and they fell for it. They clicked the link, they downloaded the malware, they installed it. Awesome. So what do you do for the investigation? Well, if you're kind of going with the old methodology and having to do everything by hand, it's going to be a lot. You could reach out to the user and ask them to forward you the email or give you more details about what they saw or did. Um, you could go to your email server and check the logs, pull the email so you can um, take a look for it for yourself. Um, you could pull the link out of the email, but make sure you don't actually click the link and put it into your sandbox to see what the behavior is, right? Um, but hopefully your employee or your investigator knows where your email server is. Hopefully they know where the logs are and hopefully they know how to interact with all of that, right? Um, once you've dealt with the email itself, it's time to start investigating the malware. How do you proceed? Uh, perhaps you have one of the live forensics tools that we mentioned earlier installed. Great. Um, but was your investigator trained on how to use it and do they know what to pull? Um, is the host even available, or will this ticket sit in a queue until someone actually remembers to go check if the host is available to move on with their investigation? Um, always, always run into that issue, right? Um, and does the malware still reside where you expect it to? Or do you need to pull it from the link mentioned in the previous slide? After you've solved the issue of actually getting the malware, um, how do you begin processing it? It's always great to grab whatever uh, open source intelligence you can about the malware, but do all your investigation, uh, investigators know where to grab that information as in, and is it consistent from person to person? Um, you could also run it in a sandbox or do some static analysis on it, but again, do you have someone on your team that is able to do that? Lastly, <laughs> so after all of that, there's even more that you'd probably want to do, which is analyze the behavior on the machine where the malware was installed. Um, you could manually look through your EDR console, the endpoint detection response tool, um, to try and find the execution. Um, but is there any particularities there? Like, I don't know about you guys, but I have used multiple EDRs where by the time I go to look at it, for some reason, the logs no longer exist in the console. Great. Yeah, always uh, hampers an investigation. Um, do you stream logs from the host into a central data lake, or do you need to grab them directly from the host? Uh, do your investigators know all the different log sources that, that, that can be actually helpful in the situation? And can you parse them in a common schema to make them easier to understand on top of each other? Like, that's a lot. A lot going on. Or you could introduce a forensic flow system, right? What if you had a single button to handle all of these questions? Um, you could automate away pulling links from an email by coding up a workflow to pull messages from a message ID from your email server. Um, and then submit that into a sandbox after parsing it through. You could automate the file collection process and sandbox detonation for the malware. Um, lastly, you could have all the logs for the machine's activity um, codified in queries and have that ready to be kicked off and placed into time sketch for an investigator to start digging into. So you can go from all of this really crazy stuff um, to maybe you have a UI to where you're just a few button clicks away from being able to collect things such as browser history. Right, um, or different files if you want to collect files. Um, let's say we're going to pull uh, browser history to see what was downloaded during the time frame that the person clicked on the phishing link to understand how that person interacted with the link and where it kind of took them in their browser. So after clicking the browser history button on the last slide, and you make it really easy in your single pane of glass, it can be just deposited into time sketch. Um, making it ready for your investigator without having to think of all of those nuanced details on the back end. Instead, they have their data ready to go. Um, they can filter on downloads, perhaps, and that's where they want to start and see everything that's here as well as the surrounding context um, from maybe those machine logs that you pulled as well for them. Um, and you can kind of see, interpose over the browser history what happened. So maybe they did this download, you see the file, right? You see process creations, and that's all kind of put together for you. Um, Overall, it just becomes a lot easier to kick off a manual investigation when you abstract away all the nuances. So cool, another case study, because I, yep, I still have time, cool. Another case study is a compromised employee account. So let's say that within your SOC, you have an alert that an employee um, account was behaving suspiciously and out of the ordinary. Um, so what do you do? How do you begin that investigation? 
Um, the first thing I would do is to understand the behavior that was alerted on. I want to see what IP address the strange behavior come from, and if there's any other anomalous IP addresses. Uh, I probably want to learn about the timing of the activity. You know, was this happening outside of normal working business hours, or is this activity kind of clustered together in a way that no person could actually do it? Um, and it might be some kind of automation. Um, and when thinking about all of these different questions I want to answer, do you know where your logs live for all of this? Do you have a query ready to go? And are all your investigators going to run the exact same query to get all the same results? Probably not. Uh, let's be honest. Uh, we also need to understand if the account um, was used in other systems that haven't been alerted on yet. Um, were, other account, were there other accounts that reuse the same credentials? Um, was transitive access allowed? So maybe the employee could impersonate service accounts, and maybe we want to start pulling that information as well. Um, and can you just differentiate between legitimate activity and attacker activity? Um, that's, a, that's a lot of questions to ask and a lot of data to comb through. Are you 100% confident all of your investigators would perform the exact same investigation and make it repeatable? Or you could instead implement a forensic flow system um, within your environment to start answering these questions immediately. Um, imagine when the investigator gets to that alert, all of this data that we just were wondering about is already put into um, an easy to view format for them. Um, and it's just ready at their fingertips, uh, pre-pulled and, and ready for review. Then all they have to do is click a link in their ticket to um, make their investigation easier. Um, you could also, you know, within time sketch, maybe utilize some of the pre-made analyzers to enrich that log, enrich those logs and tag them in ways that'll make it easier for you such as understanding when something's coming from an office IP or a non-office IP. Um, and you can group together events based on working hours. Um, something that I really like that becomes easier to do during an investigation with time sketch um, is statistics, right? So maybe I want to understand um, what are some of the most frequently used IP addresses? Is, is there any kind of anomalous behavior here? And we can kind of see. I've got a bunch of IP addresses, but one was used almost 15,000 times, and the next one was 104. Um, so using something like TimeSketch and having all of that data in one place allows you to spot anomalies pretty quickly. Yeah, you could also do the reverse um, and look at some of the least commonly used IP addresses as well, um, in case the threat actor is rotating through a lot of IP addresses to attempt to obfuscate their behavior. Um, but let's say we have the known bad IP address that had almost 15,000 um, hits. Uh, with all this data kind of interposed on top of each other and pulled for me at my fingertips, I can start to look for what behavior happened. Um, here, I, I love that each data source has their own color, so we can see how they kind of interact with together. Um, and we can see a login from the bad IP address um, shortly after running a query on super secret data um, to suggest that the attacker logged in and exfiltrated data out from their compromised employee's account. Cool. Um, I have another case study for you. Let's say a compromised Kubernetes node. Um, so here you've received an alert um, from your cloud provider suggesting there were strange connections between your Kubernetes node and a known malicious IP address. Now with this, you need to investigate if something malicious happened within your cloud environment. So what do you do? Um, first is to see what log sources you actually have available. Um, do you have log sources for network connections that are made from your Kubernetes nodes, and can you attribute them to individual containers within your node? Um, the same question goes for process logs. Can you see all the, um, or can you see the process that started the network connection and what the other actions that process did? Um, this all becomes particularly critical when you have a multi-tenancy cluster that allows multiple teams to deploy to the same infrastructure. Um, and then perhaps you want to do dead box forensics on the node itself to understand more about the containers that were running and the file system that they were running on. Um, however, do you know what permissions you need to have within that cloud environment to take the disk image? It could take a few steps from getting the snapshot from the original project into your forensic project for analysis, um, particularly when you go cross cloud. Uh, and nothing is worse than scrambling in the moment, trying to debug exactly what you need to do so. Um, another issue is if the disk even still exists. Uh, again, the goal of uh, Kubernetes is to create very scalable, ephemeral environments. Uh, there's no guarantee the disk is still going to be around by the time a person starts to look at the ticket. Uh, lastly, is your team fully trained to run all the necessary tools to perform dead box forensics and understand the results? 
Instead, <laughs> to make it even easier, what if your forensic flow system could do most of the heavy lifting? Uh, when the alert fires, you could immediately pull all the relevant information from your data lake um, for those process logs or network logs into a timeline for the investigator to start their analysis. Um, you could also have a disk image already taken with no hassle about what permissions were required to do so. Um, you can then take away the triage level forensics with Turbinia, so the basic artifacts you'll always want to have are ready uh, for your investigator to review. Um, and then the investigator then can focus on answering the immediate question of was this malicious activity, instead of focusing on how to collect that data to answer, really shortening that time of making that decision and if this is an actual incident, your mean time to investigation is much shorter, right? Um, or mean time to resolution is much shorter. And then my last case study, and uh, yep, still got time, cool, uh, is gonna be a bit of a stretch, uh, but let's talk about how a forensic flow system could actually help with vulnerability management. Kind of strange. Um, so let's say our vulnerability management team comes to you and they wanna know across all of the cloud instances if a certain CVE or other vulnerability exists. Seems like a fair ask, right? Um, so what do we do next? Uh, well, you could always throw a lot of money at a vendor, because uh, there are companies that can just do this for you and scan your cloud environments. Um, but there's always pros and cons here, right? Uh, pro is you don't have to do anything, you just pay someone and they do it for you, um, and they maintain the system, um, which is a huge perk, because uh, it can be difficult. Um, but the cons are you lose a lot of historical data um, and the ability to more effectively manipulate the results uh, for your environment to help out other functions of the organization other than just vulnerability management. Um, maybe you could do something instead and get creative and SSH into all those cloud instances, right? Um, and run a script to, to be able to do the scanning yourself. Could work, possibly. Um, depends on the environment you're running in. Uh, but one of the biggest problems is unless you have a golden image everybody's deploying with, um, with a user baked into SSH and with, um, how can you guarantee that you can actually get into the box? Many of the tools necessary um, to do so to get in uh, need to be installed by the person who created the box, and I'm sure we all know how reliable developers are on using our golden image. So what if instead we allow our forensic flow system, oops, sorry, forensic flow system to handle this? Um, well, one guarantee we have with cloud environments is that cloud native solutions work. Uh, so taking snapshots of disks do not actually require anything being installed on the machine itself, but instead rely on cloud native APIs to handle this, uh, which means it's actually really scalable because all your, uh, all your application needs to do is make an API call and then your cloud provider actually does all the heavy lifting on the back end, um, keeping the resource requirements for you actually quite low. Um, as we already kind of figured out how to take disk images for a single machine, why not scale it out? We have a scalable environment. We could do it for all virtual machines. Really the only thing stopping you is cost. Um, so we have the capability to create these snapshots. It's also just another cloud API to mount those snapshots onto a running virtual machine. Why not have the forensic system do that? Uh, absolutely could. We were going to use LibCloud Forensics which have those calls ready for you. Um, we could then have a virtual machine within the forensic um, environment that, that's basically a golden image of a vulnerability scanner. And there's a lot of open source ones out there that you could use. Um, or you could pay a vendor for it as well, um, as it would be easier to pay for a vulnerability fee than it would be to, to make a scan yourself. Um, but because it's your golden image, you can bake, a, bake in whatever custom scans that you want. Um, and then after the scans are run, you can easily export all that data out into your data lake and use it in within your um, existing alerting pipelines to notify you of vulnerabilities that exist within your environment. Um, you also get to control the schema here, so um, you can make it do exactly what you want. Um, and I love that. So, uh, oh, And one other thing I wanted to mention that I didn't see in my notes is you also then, because you control that data, you get the historical context, right? And so that becomes critical during incident management because you really want to understand exactly when a system became vulnerable. Um, so you can understand the root cause of the problem. If there was a patch applied and the attack came after the fact, that's great evidence to know. You won't typically get that from a typical vendor because they don't keep historical context because it's expensive to, to store that data. Um, so personally, I love it. I would love to build a vulnerability management into the forensic flow system. Um, cool, so last stretch of the presentation, and I, I'll go through it quickly to save some time for questions. Um, let's go over some of the lessons learned that I've had. 
Um, one of the big ones was determine notification paths early. It's really cool when you automate away a really complex um, forensic capability. Like, that's great and you should do it. But if you don't remember to tell the people the forensic flow is done or notify them in some way, people are going to forget it. And then your data becomes obsolete and it's like nobody wants to use your system. So think about the best way to notify the people when it's done, whether that be through you know, Slack or email or commenting on a ticket. Think of the best way to notify your users of the system that it's actually time to review the data. Um, give clear and concise error messages to investigators. Um, people need to know exactly what's going on, um, and they're going to get frustrated if it just silently fails on the back end. Um, there's also expected failures and unexpected failures, such as perhaps the file doesn't exist anymore and that's an expected failure, or now there's a bug in the code and, and it's unexpected. Um, give those clear messages to the investigators to either debug themselves or give them to you to debug for them. Um, have metrics and have them early. Uh, the best way to ensure that your product is funded and getting the attention it deserves is to collect metrics. You want to understand how long um, it takes for flows to be run, how often this is getting used, and then how much time you're actually saving investigators by having this data at their fingertips instead of making them scramble to figure it all out. Um, so get metrics early. And then audit trails are best trails. Uh, your system is going to be highly privileged because it's doing forensic workflows on your behalf. Um, make sure you can audit all of that behavior and take some time to threat model what the abuse could be within the system and find ways to detect and prevent that. Um, another one uh, is integration saves headache. Integration testing saves headaches. Uh, find a way to test your workflow end to end. Um, and I say this without having figured out the solution yet because integration testing is really hard. Um, but I would say prioritize this in a short-term roadmap um, because it really just takes one bug in your code to have this cascading effect. And if your forensic system isn't available during an incident, you're going to have a bad day. And people are going to wonder, why did we just pay you a bunch of money to build this and it doesn't even work at the time? So integration testing. And then my final lesson learned is to keep in mind, a human is always going to be the best investigator. And while you can and should automate triage-level forensics away, you should still invest in at least one person on your team to be the subject matter expert in forensics to help drive this project forward. Because you do need to keep up with the times. You need to know the new techniques and where new artifacts live. Um, so while you should autom absolutely automate things away, don't, you still need to spend time training people um, to be subject, at least one person to be a subject matter expert. Cool. All right. With all that being said, thank you for listening to me ramble for quite some time. Um, if you want to get in touch, here's my information, uh, LinkedIn and, and email. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your conference. So. <laughs>
when there's a new log source available, let's say you're switching email providers, um, you have one place to update it, and all of that knowledge just becomes available to the next person without having to train them to look in the different place. Um, so I think there's ways that you can say, like, look at these really repeatable investigations for this really common use case um, and how much more efficient we could be. And I think having the metrics to back that up, so maybe you're, you're taking, um, how long does it take to typically do a ticket for a business email compromise um, before and then after your system is, is implemented? So then you can say, like, it used to take us, you know, 30 minutes to grab all of that data. Now it takes us five. So I've, you know, I've exponentially scaled our ability to do these, and I can do six times more tickets in the same amount of time. Um, so making sure you're collecting metrics to validate your, your use case afterwards so your project doesn't get killed and say, well, no one used it, right? So, so that would, that's what I would say. Like really bring up the repeatability and consistency of investigations would be the number one way to get it funded. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for this very interesting uh, talk. Um, one question, um, what do you think, how long do you need to build up an uh, um, investigation uh, system uh, or line like this? Yeah. It's, it's not a CI pipe, it's a investigation pipe. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. I think um, the thing that took me the longest to do was starting with the architecture, right, of like, how do I, not even what flows am I going to run, but like how does the system kind of step through each step? So I think designing that takes the longest. Um, but I was it in the keynote, she mentioned perfection shouldn't be the goal. It's get something reasonable and working, right? And so for me, what I found really successful was I found a really common use case. Um, so I think one of the first things we implemented was collecting browser history because we used it in so many tickets. Having it readily available was incredibly helpful. So I focus on having a single workflow, right, to start. Of I collect the browser history, I process it with Plazo, and I put it into Time Sketch, um, and I automate that away, and then I notify. Um, and I just built that first one. I made that first one work really well, and people got excited, like, "Whoa, this is already in here!" And then I have my teammates like, "Can you also do this? Like, I know I want to run these three queries every time this single alert comes through." Can you build me that? And then you just slowly start building it on top of each other. So I would say it doesn't actually, as long as you don't try to boil the ocean, it doesn't take that much time to get started. Um, yeah, you just you find your most prevalent use case that's going to get you a bunch of use out of it immediately to build momentum on the team. And I think when if you have the resources and more people get excited about it, you get more people to contribute as well, um, which then makes it that much quicker to be able to implement. Um, so take some time on your design process. Find a really solid use case that'll get people excited, and it'll be quicker to, to develop than you'd expect, especially if you don't expect perfection. I went through many iterations on my code um, and improved it as I went, because I just, let's get something working, right? So. Any more questions? I think that's it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.